This week, let's shift into the kinds of insects that feed in a different way, that feed by removing fluids from the plant. Uh, most of these are going to be in the insect order Hemiptera. Uh, we'll also later speak about thrips and spider mites, which also have this habit. But the learning objectives in this week are to review the basics of the life history of the key insect groups that feed with sucking mouth parts, aphids, white flies, true bugs being uh, the ones we're going to focus on primarily at this point in time. Compare the differences in how they feed and some of the associated injuries you see because even though they mo both feed with a similar type of mouth part, they might feed in a different part of the plant, cause a different kind of injury. And then we'll discuss what kinds of management principles there are for uh, these kinds of insects. And we'll start with aphids, and we'll work with aphids in this module and the next, uh, an important group that occur on a wide variety of plants. Uh, there are a great many species. Um, in my state, we have about 350 native species, and a great many have been introduced from other c countries, and new species are found and brought into the country all the time. So aphids are a fairly simple looking kind of insect. They tend to be kind of uh, this uh, oval, broadly oval uh, form. They might have structures on the hind end that are, are more or less conspicuous. The uh, cornicles kind of look like tailpipes and they might have a little caudal tail or f uh, that uh, also might be uh, conspicuous. These are sometimes useful when we're trying to identify the species of aphid we're talking about. But they all look pretty much the same. They're all small. They're all soft. They can range in color and patterning. Um, so we can have fairly small aphids, uh, and we can have fairly large ones. Uh, there's quite a bit range. The biggest ones will be those that are occurring on stems. And within a species, there might be a uh, range in color. So for instance, on the right, it's rose aphids on a single branch. And they're all the same species. And, and again, there may be patterns as well as colors among the different aphids. And some you'll find are covered with wax to, to some degree or another. Uh, and this would be in the form of maybe a fine powder of wax that's indicated by the aphids in this picture. These are cabbage aphids. And they're kind of dusty with the wax that's come through little pores on the back of their body. Uh, I think maybe in the bottom, if you look at the bottom of this picture, you can see one that's just molted, and it doesn't have that kind of uh, grayish wax on it yet, but it will. And then there are some aphids that carry this to an extreme, uh, where the wax comes out in the form of long, thin threads uh, that completely obscure the insect. Uh, we'll come back to this uh, more when we get into uh, woody plant insects in the ornamental section and. 356C, but uh, woolly aphids are uh, found on various kinds of woody plants, uh, including apples. Some aphids are associated with the roots of plants. Uh, sugar beet root aphid is one that um, we see quite a bit here. I see it on uh, particularly garden beets, uh, but uh, I've also seen it on spinach and quinoa. Uh, rice root aphid is uh, found on a great many kinds of plants, uh, particularly indoor uh, production. You'll see it on lettuce or other greenhouse vegetables. It's also grown. Uh, it also occurs on the roots of cannabis. And there's aphids on uh, dandelion roots and other kinds of plants. Some of the root infesting aphids will also be surrounded by the wax. Some, not all. If you were to pull a, 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 a root ball out and see kind of this cottony material, look close uh, and you may see the aphids tucked in there. It may be some other cause, say a, a, a fungus growth, but uh, it could be the wax covering some root infesting aphid. Now aphids are small, aphids are soft bodied, but that does not allow them to get away without having to molt. All arthropods molt and they will molt uh, typically three times as they grow and here we see an aphid stepping out of her old skin. Now these old skins remain behind with these kinds of insects. Um, all insects have to molt, but insects that chew will usually turn around and eat the the old cast skin. So you say you would not find a, an old skin of a of a grasshopper or earwig or something like that, but you would with these kinds of insects because they use mouth parts designed to pull fluids uh, out of plants, piercing sucking mouth parts, and they can't chew, so they couldn't consume the old discarded skin. And 
these can develop, uh, uh, these can uh, land on the plants and, and become quite visible. So for instance, this is a garden plant that I had in my greenhouse a little bit ago and clearly had a lot of aphids on this plant, uh, green peach aphids in this case. But the picture on the right just shows a leaf that was heavily um, covered with the discarded skins from, from these aphids. Now, aphids have a couple of things that are fairly unique to them, and one of them has to do with the way that they reproduce. Uh, the norm for aphids is asexual reproduction, meaning there are no males, there's no mating, and the mother gives birth to a genetically identical daughter aphid. Uh, and that is the norm for all aphids, and in some aphids that is the only way we've ever seen them reproduce. Uh, we'll get into this in a little bit, but if they do produce a male and have sexual reproduction and do produce eggs, that will only occur at the very end of the growing season. But uh, up until this year, uh, I have never seen a male aphid, so I doubt most of you will ever see a male aphid. It will be a female aphid giving live birth to a genetically identical daughter aphid. Her daughter aphid, by the way, is already giving birth uh, or uh, not giving birth, but uh, uh, maturing her eggs at the point of being born. So an aphid mother is not only a new mother, she's a new expectant grandmother. Now because of this, aphid numbers can increase extremely rapidly. All it takes is a single aphid to find a plant in one way or another. Uh, if the aphid is a mature uh, uh, female, she'll start producing young maybe at a rate of four or five per day. In about 10 days or so, each of them will be producing four or five young per day for as long as they live. So uh, you could have easily a thousand aphids a couple of weeks after you've had uh, um, uh, just a single aphid. So live birth and asexual reproduction are the norm with aphids. Uh, and here we have a couple of uh, pictures. Uh, the one on the right shows a wingless aphid giving live birth and the one on the left shows two aphids that are winged and they're giving birth as well. So that brings up another thing about uh, aphids and that is the ability to produce a winged adult form. Adult aphids may be winged or wingless. Uh, this is something that is not determined by genetics. Uh, they could be either a winged morph or a wingless morph. Uh, they will tend to produce more wing stages if there's some reason to leave the plant. Uh, they're getting overcrowded, the plant's going down in quality, and at certain times of the year, day length will trigger them to produce wing forms. But if everything's going well, most of them will stay on the plant and be wingless. Uh, it's a pretty dicey operation for a winged aphid to leave a plant and try to find a new one. They're blind, essentially, can tell very little detail, they can't smell, and they're not very good flyers. So most of them fail to find a, a plant once they leave it, but some do. They produce enough, uh, enough uh, of their kind to uh, allow this way of working uh, uh, to succeed. Now here would be a picture uh, showing this again uh, in a different context. This is a group of aphids, and these could all be genetically identical sisters. Uh, born most of them probably the same day, at least the group in the center. And the one in the upper part of this picture that looks like it's got little shoulder pads and it's got a little bit of color to it, uh, one, one molt away, uh, uh, one next molt, uh, she will become a winged form. Uh, the other one surrounding her, sisters, no, no shoulder pad looking uh, development off the side, they'll be a wingless adult. So again, one molt away, some will have wings and some will be wingless. Now, aphids run up against a problem outdoors when you live in a place like I live where you have freezing temperatures in the winter. And aphids can only develop on living plants. They, uh, and if the plants are dead, there's nothing for them to feed on. Plus it gets quite cold and they would freeze. So how do aphids outdoors survive between seasons? And that's where an egg comes up. They're going to produce an egg that remains dormant throughout the winter. 
I'll talk about some of the other things that can happen after that. But the primary way in a cold climate where aphids get through winter is through production of an egg, an externally laid egg. And this gets into a kind of complicated aspect of, of aphids. Uh, where you have production of, of, a, of an egg, an externally laid egg, we are talking about what's called a holocyclic life cycle. So in this life cycle, there will be a sexual generation, a sexual form female and male that mate. It will result in an externally laid egg, and that will be the overwintering stage uh, between seasons. And as we'll see, sometimes this involves alternation of host plants, meaning they will lay their eggs on one kind of plant in the fall. They will remain on that plant through the winter, and when eggs hatch, they'll be on it in the spring, but then they move to a summer host. So we'll have winter hosts and summer hosts. There are, be, there are a few cases where aphids will live continuously year-round if their host plant is available. Uh, and we'll show you a couple outdoor examples there. And of course, indoors, uh, aphids do not have to produce eggs. But these are what aphid eggs would look like. So this is on the left. These are aphid eggs on, on my rose plant. Uh, and that's the overwintering stage. And then they hatch in the spring with bud break. And we get the aphids uh, starting the next season. Uh, this is a picture I just took. Uh, this last year, which actually shows uh, a male aphid, two male aphids, and egg laying. It happens, it's the cannabis aphid here. The picture on the left is a male mating with the form of an aphid produced at the end of the year, the female form that produces an egg. There's a single male, which is winged in the middle, and on the right is that special uh, female after she has mated that is laying some eggs. So, this is the first time I had ever seen a, a male aphid or mating aphids. But again, the overwintering egg is going to be the, the stage that gets uh, that allows this insect to survive between seasons. On most, uh, uh, in most situations, that aphid would lay it on a perennial plant, so a tree or shrub, something that will be there next year. The buds break. The the uh, eggs hatch. Uh, occasionally they'll lay it on an herbaceous plant like that uh, hemp plant that I sh showed in the previous picture. And in that case the eggs hatch and if there's a volunteer plant right near there then they can move to that. But normally they lay their eggs on some kind of winter host that is a perennial. Now this uh, life cycle can get complicated it can involve host alternation, as I mentioned briefly before. So we're going to see at different times of the year the same kind of aphid found on one kind of plant or another when you have a species with, with this kind of life history, this holocyclic life cycle, complete life cycle, with host alternation. So let's take the green peach aphid, a, a very common aphid, uh, in an outdoor situation. It, outdoors it is going to alternate hosts and we'll have this complete uh, uh, complete uh, uh, life cycle, the holocyclic life cycle. So this would be a graph showing this and uh, it's complicated looking and it, it is complicated. Uh, so let's go through it. It starts with the egg being the overwintering stage. So just under the that little arrow there is the little shiny egg, in this case around the base of a peach. The green peach aphid lays its eggs on a winter annual host that is something in the genus Prunus. All these aphids are specific in what they'll use for a winter host. Just a couple of kinds of Prunus, uh, peach, uh, apricot, nectarine, those would be big ones. So there's the egg, that little shiny object there. The egg will hatch in spring after bud break, and then the form of the aphid that hatches from an overwintered egg is called the stem mother. And she starts it all off every year. Uh, when she becomes full grown, she'll start to produce young. Uh, and then when they become full grown, they'll start to produce young. All females, this is all normal reproduction at this point in time. 
and they may have several generations on that host uh, that they uh, started on in the year uh, originally as the egg in this case a, a peach leaf and there may be some issues with this uh, in, in some cases and we'll revisit this later aphids may cause the leaves to curl as they do in peach with green peach aphid but at some point in time in late spring and certainly by early summer uh, the aphids will all have a different habit and they will all produce winged forms this is triggered by day length and they will all leave the plant so even if you don't do anything they will leave the plant so you will have wing forms produced sometime in, in this case in June and they all leave the plant and were you to find that same aphid species in the summertime it wouldn't be on peach or nectarine or uh, apricot it'd be on some herbaceous plant green peach aphid you can find it on peppers and spinach and pigweeds and potatoes and all manner of plants and, and there'll be several generations uh, uh, occurring on these summer hosts uh, wingless adults winged adults but all females during this time multiple generations and then day length triggers uh, a change in late summer you're going to see the female producing some winged males and winged females they leave they seek the winter host in this case a peach or an apricot and if successful the uh, they'll stay there and a sexual form female is then produced and the male mates with it resulting in the eggs so pretty complicated um, but uh, this is the way a lot of aphids uh, do get through winter with two different hosts and the holocyclic life cycle uh, at least in areas where it gets cold uh, if you're not living in Florida this is not your problem but but up here it is and uh, some examples um, the sugar beet root aphid that I showed that might be on beets uh, that's the summer host beets are the summer host the winter host is certain kinds of poplars uh, and they will make a gall they'll make a little stem a little swelling in the midrib of the leaves as indicated in the picture on the right so uh, certain kinds of poplars would be the winter host and sugar beets and spinach and the like would be the summer host uh, this is one that I used to have as a common problem on my parsley and dill and I no longer have an issue with it uh, um, for uh, a reason that uh, bring up right now here the uh, winter host of this insect is, is uh, uh, certain European willows the summer host is parsley dill and other carrot family plants it's called the willow carrot aphid I formerly had this as a chronic problem in my yard I now no longer do and that's result that that's a result of my taking out a, a willow tree in my yard I had the only willow in the neighborhood that supported this in the winter stage when I removed it it there is no place for for this insect to survive between seasons anyway there are a few kinds of aphids the outdoors that do manage to make it uh, through the winter and that's if their host uh, is is alive through the winter and around here the big example and it's an important example is cabbage aphid uh, because there are cabbage family plants that do survive even in fairly cold climates uh, over winter uh, people over winter say their cabbage or their uh, uh, cauliflower or, or like more, more often I guess kale but those it, it, it is green living tissue throughout the winter so this one can survive there's also some winter annual mustards on which it could survive so that's one of the only kinds of aphids uh, around here that is actually able to survive a place like like Colorado so outdoors the norm is going to be for an egg to be produced as the stage that survives between season with rare exceptions say a cabbage aphid that's going to be uh, one that can allow continuous reproduction without that egg but indoors it's it's the normal pattern if you're growing uh, plants indoors in a greenhouse or if you're uh, living in an area that doesn't have the freezing winters um, there's not going to be any egg production it's going to be all females uh, and some will be winged and some won't uh, these would be probably the three biggest species that you'll see, see on indoor plants in your greenhouse that green peach aphid same one we 
uh, mentioned earlier, outdoors will produce eggs on prunus in the fall, but indoors, no. 365 days a year you can have green peach aphid on your plants. Uh, if you see kind of a darkish colored aphid, it's probably one we call the cotton mellow aphid, melon aphid. And one that's a little bigger than the others is usually the potato aphid. So there are certain kinds of things that aphids can pr produce on plants, and that's going to be the subject of the uh, next discussion. So uh, we'll talk a little about how they can c contaminate produce, damage plants from their feeding, but then also want to get into some uh, other aspects like the honeydew that they produce, uh, leaf curl distortions, and a bit on the situations where they can be vectors of some viral diseases.